Disclaimer, I do not give permission for cloning of my voice, sampling of my voice, the use of my voice to train AI, or to be used in TTS or used in another channel's videos without my permission. Any unauthorized use will be prosecuted. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I hope you are all well. Thank you all so much for the love and support you have shown me. I am fully recovered and life is going back to normal. So, back to pumping out that vocal melatonin that you all crave. Down in the description box, you can find the Buy Me A Coffee link. And if you choose to do so, it would be greatly appreciated as it supports me and the channel. As well, if you'd like to become a member of Back to Ashes, tier started $1.99 a month and up. That information can also be found in the description box below. Now, with all of that out of the way, it is time to go back to ashes. For when we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, braver, and happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Let's Not Meet Stories. Disclaimer, some of these stories contain material that's not suitable for all. Listing discretion is advised. As soon as this introduction is over, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there'll be one more ad. After that, there'll be no more ads to play throughout the rest of the video. I answered the door for a guy who was dressed as a UPS driver. Even had a logo on his jacket and everything. I assume my parents had ordered something that I needed to sign for, so I answered it. After opening the door and greeting him, I realized that not only did he not have anything for me, but there wasn't even a UPS truck in sight. He told me his name was Tony and that he was selling lawn care services around the neighborhood. I started to figure that Maybe he was just a UPS worker who forgot to change clothes before starting his second job as a landscaper or gardener. But then, he started asking me weird questions like if we have any security cameras or large dogs in our house. We do have security cameras, but they're quite hidden, and I told him we did not. And even though our largest dog is a one-year-old beagle, I told him we have two pit bulls. This entire time, he wasn't looking at me. He was almost looking around me, letting his eyes coast around the inside of my house, probably looking for visible sights of something valuable. He then asked me the weirdest question. He asked why I had my door cracked instead of opened all the way. I lied and said it was because I didn't want my pit bulls to see him and start going nuts. Truth is, I always do this when I answer the door for strangers, so I can close it as fast as possible, should they try something. He then gave me a poorly made flyer for his supposed long gear business and went off down the street to the next house. I shut my door and locked all of the locks on it. Tony, I hope I don't see you on the news anytime soon. It finally started raining here, so I took my 14-year-old son out mushroom hunting over the weekend. It was later than we normally go, and the sun goes down much earlier but we were taking a quick trail to the river and back in hopes to find turkey trails or chanterelles. We took a wrong turn and ended up going through a big field, which the trail would take us back around to the main trail to the river. As we walked toward the main trail, the last group of people had left and it was just me and my son. We walked along and out of the thicket side trail came this weird man. He had a dog with him that was alert at his side. He was staring at us as we walked closer towards him. Then he started waving at us, this really weird slow wave. 
I was immediately uncomfortable and goosebumpy, but didn't want to be impolite, so I half-hearted waved back while staring back and telling my son to slow up a little bit. I didn't want to actually meet up at the junction. After a full minute of us dwaddling, the guy slowly turned and began walking down the trail toward the main trail. I was wary walking, didn't want to go too fast, and we stopped to look at some plants. So the guy and dog got further down this trail, which curved to the right and continued on two blocks to the junction. I was thinking, if this was a creepy let's not meet, this dude will be waiting around the corner. And sure enough, he was standing at the junction, off to the left and toward the parking lot, and to the right was a .6 mile trail to the river. Dude was just standing there with his dog, staring at us, not moving at all. Both my son and I were like, holy shit, what the F? Let's keep wide to the right. And saying he looks old, we could run faster than him and just generally planning for freaky deaky just in case. He kept staring at us, so as we approached, I asked if he was okay and kept staring back. He was greasy haired, tiny round glasses, a blue windbreaker, plaid long shorts, maybe about 50 years old. His dog was a small beagle mix. He didn't answer me at all. He just kept staring. We turned to the right and walked about a block. I had my phone cam facing me so I could watch over my shoulder and the only movement was him slowly shifting his direction to continue staring at us. I didn't say anything else to him. It was moderately unsettling, his stare, made more so by his lack of response, emotionless face, weird tiny glasses, slow wave at us like zombie mother effer. He did leave because on our way back, he was no longer standing on the main trail. So hey, freaky deaky forest zombie dude, for sure stay in the thickets, and I hope we never meet again. The story kind of creeped me out. It happened nine years ago, and sometimes comes to my mind. It still gives me the creeps to this day. So... I was on an adult dating site, one of the fetish types. I know, don't judge me. I was just looking for some fun. Anyway, I was stupid and gave out more information than I should have. I was chatting with a guy. He had asked me at some point what I did for work. At the time, I was working at a McDonald's, so I told him. He asked which one. I stupidly told him which one. We chatted off and on. We hadn't been chatting for too long. I also stupidly gave him my phone number at some point. He would talk about how he wanted to meet me on my break and have some fun on said break. I told him no thanks. I don't bring my lifestyle to my job. Anyway, so I checked my messages just before I was due to clock out of work. Luckily, I did. He mentioned that he was at my job and told me what he ordered. I think it was a Big Mac meal. I thought to myself, um, okay, well, don't expect me to do anything with you. I'm not interested. He then got upset and wasn't accepting that I wasn't interested. I was also scared because I had sent him a face picture of myself, but I had never received one from him. I really wasn't too interested in him, so I decided I didn't need a face picture since I likely wasn't going to meet up with him. His interests weren't what I was looking for, 
and I have a hard time straight up saying I'm not interested, and just slowly started to ghost whoever I had no interest in. Now, luckily, I hadn't told him my work schedule, so he didn't know that I was about to clock out. After clocking out, I told one of my managers that I was on a dating site, and some guy just showed up to my work, and I have no idea what he looks like, and that I was going to hang out in the back in the break room for a bit. Luckily, she didn't judge me, and just told me, oh, okay. So, I waited about half an hour before I left. I didn't have a car at the time and had to walk home. I was afraid he would see me and try to pick me up in his car. Luckily, no one followed me, so I was in the clear. I don't think he ever messaged me or I ended up blocking him or something of the sort. I don't know if this really is all that creepy, but it creeps me out that some random person just decided that he would show up to my job and expect me to want to meet up with him. So, yeah. Now, I just give a vague response as to where I work now. I don't work in the same town I live in, so it would be hard to pinpoint my exact location. This opened my eyes and made me more aware of the information I give out to strangers. To the creepy guy I met online, I hope we never meet again. This happened in the late 90s. My name is Catherine, a 43-year-old female, and my friend is Rose, 42. We met this guy together. My stalker was a guy Rose and I met on the bus one day coming home from my volunteer work after school as a candy striper at the local hospital. We were on the bus going home, laughing and talking and this guy just randomly sits by us and starts talking. He tells us his name and we laugh, thinking he said his name was gay. Yeah, stupid teenage girls. He corrected us and said his name was Jay. We talked a bit more and innocently gave him our names and he asked for my number, but I said no. He was like seven years older and kind of strange the more we talked to him. He got annoyed, but whatever, right? So we thought that was that. A few days later, maybe a week later, me and the same friend run into Jay while switching buses downtown. I was going to her house like I did a few times a week when we run into him. He asked me to hang out and watch him play hockey that night. I said no. I was going to my friend. He got weirdly annoyed and kept trying and begging me, telling me how much fun it would be and trying to get me away from my friend. He really didn't want her to come to his hockey game either, just wanted it to be us. That was so weird. Our bus finally came and we got out of there fast. Over the next few weeks, I kept running into him downtown. It was like he knew my schedule. And every time I tried to be nice, but get away as fast as I could. And every time he would get annoyed because I wouldn't hang out. A few weeks pass and I'm at school and in walks Jay. I was so mad and frustrated. And so, I snap on him. Why was he here? And how did he know what school I went to? Did he follow me on the city bus? He tried saying that he was there to see his friends, but he wasn't with anyone. Just a 25-year-old guy wandering around a high school. After that, I would randomly see him on my bus, and he would always try to sit across from me and watch. He would still ask for us to hang out and I would still say no. As time went on, he would still find me on the bus and sit across from me, 
with who I guess was his girlfriend or a girl he was trying to make me jealous with. He would look at me while making out with her. He would do everything he could to make me feel uncomfortable. I would either turn up my music or do my best to ignore him or move to another spot. Nothing ever seemed to deter him. He never did anything bad enough to call the police, but he knew it was wrong, and he knew it bothered me, and he knew I would have a panic attack, and I'm sure he got off on that. As the years went on, I would see less and less of him. He would randomly pop up and make me uncomfortable. He started standing really close to me and tried to talk. I would have a panic attack and do my best to ignore him. I would still walk away, and he would just get more pushy. Every time I would run into him, I would text my friend that was there when we first ran into him and get her to calm me down. It's now 2023, so 24-ish years since it all started, and I haven't seen him in the last maybe eight years, and I'm just praying that I never see him again. I'm 43, so he must be going on 50, and I'm still scared to run into him. I have thought I saw him a few times and panicked, but it wasn't him. I hope I never see Jay ever again. This is around 2017 in spring or fall. I was 19 at the time and I live in Germany. Me and my friends used to hang out at a friend's basement, smoke the good stuff and play video games or watch movies until late at night. My best friend at the time lived just a couple houses down the street from where I lived and usually it was the two of us riding our bikes back home. There were two routes we used to get home, one through the city and the other significantly shorter, one through a small forest, maybe one kilometer, completely dark but proper forest road. That route made a 90 degree turn to cross some rails and a major unlit highway via a bridge. We only took that route when we were equipped with lights and in a group of at least two people. Because there were a lot of bores and you don't want to be on your own in case something happens. So, one night, we set out to ride home, both quite stoned and maybe a couple of beers in, but not off the deep end. As we got close to that 90 degree turn, where the road heads up to the bridge, my friend who was riding in front of me suddenly breaks because there was a relatively large tree laying across the road. We both took our bikes and lifted them over the tree and continued. Maybe 10 to 20 meters later, we suddenly spot a fire on the side, right at the junction where we had to make our turn just the size of a small campfire. We both got a little slower as we saw the fire, and then when getting closer, we spotted six or seven people around the fire, forming a semicircle, all facing us. All of them were wearing long white dresses or gowns with masks. Not Ku Klux-like masks, but rather like a sailor's hat with veils. A couple of seconds went by. We were just staring at them, and I guess they were staring at us. Then, one of them moved towards us, and we started to sprint away towards the bridge, on our bikes and didn't stop, until we were on a well-lit road again. That's been the craziest story among me and my friends ever since. So, to those people out there in those strange masks and dresses... I hope we never, ever meet again. I keep reposting this story because I hope that it might serve 
as a warning to those working late at night. I was 24 at the time, working in a nightclub about a 10 minute walk from my home. I used to close on Tuesday nights slightly earlier than most nights as it was generally our slowest night of the week, closing around 12 a.m. instead of keeping customers until 2.30 a.m. Usually, I'd be the only one left as I'd start cutting staff as the night went on, and since it was a slower day of the week, we didn't have security on duty. About two months in of regularly closing at 12 a.m., I was walking home, I used to bring bulkier clothes to hide my figure when leaving alone, as I've been followed and chased home multiple times before, and we'd often get men waiting after hours for us girls to come out, knowing we'd eventually come out after closing and didn't want to attract attention to myself. I also used to walk home as I didn't have a car and had a few terrifying experiences with Uber drivers not exactly driving me home, turning out to be fake cabs and Uber drivers or harassing me until I pretended to show interest or give them some way of contacting me, to which Uber would just give me a $5 coupon for the trouble. But that's a story for another time. The bar was located along a main road that was home to the majority of the other bars and restaurants in the city downtown. Often at this time, I'd maybe see a handful of people, but the streets were generally empty. I'm walking and noticed a parked car about a block away. The driver noticed me and U-turns around to be on the same side of the street as myself. Now he's catcalling me and trying to get me to come into his car. I don't engage and keep walking. We're maybe a block or two past the initial spot I saw him, and he's been slowly driving alongside the sidewalk. I'd cross the street, but didn't want to get near his car. He keeps this up until about the halfway mark when he takes off in his car, and I'm just relieved he's gone. Psych. Guess who comes blasting back down the road? You guessed it, he does. Now, my walk has turned into a light jog, which then turns into me full on running. I'm running behind closed bars and businesses now, trying to find a back route to get home without him seeing me and where I live. At one point, I'm running through bushes and mud. No matter what street I end up on, his car is waiting for me. Eventually, I run right in front of his car while it's parked on the side street beside my place and run into my house through the back entrance. The back entrance is obscured by plenty of trees and cars and the surrounding houses are multiple unit homes, so I was confident he didn't see what door I got in through. Fast forward to the following Tuesday and I'm walking home. Guess whose car is parked at the halfway mark? This went on for the next four Tuesdays. Except he started parking on the street in front of my house. Until I begged my manager to take me off closing that specific shift. The last time I saw him, one of the apartment buildings along the way had a few cop cars and cops standing around the entrance and I stayed with them, which led him to drive off for the night. A week passes, and I'm no longer on that shift. A co-worker of mine sends me a news article via text. I open it and see that the man who's been following me was arrested for doing this to multiple girls in the city, along the street my work was on, and that I lived on. He got caught because he'd followed a university student up to her house and wouldn't drive away. She called the cops and he was still there by the time they came to arrest him. He got out the next day, I believe, and was arrested a few more times and was put on restrictions. 
couldn't be out of his parents' house between certain hours, unaccompanied by either parent, before he was deported. I've also heard he didn't actually get deported, but I moved away shortly after and didn't keep up with the news on him. I don't live there anymore and wouldn't be giving myself away. So, to the creep in the car who used to follow me and multiple other young women home, let's not ever meet again. Hello everyone. I wanted to share my scary encounter that occurred just yesterday on the bus. So, for a bit of context, I'm a college student. Without giving too many details, I'm a woman on the smaller side of average female height. I currently do not have a car, so I use my bike, walking, and the bus to get around. My college has a transit service that allows you to scan in with a student boarding pass for free. Other non-students are allowed to ride the bus by paying upon entering or purchasing a ticket beforehand. I frequently ride the bus for various reasons, grocery runs or treating myself to food. And yesterday, I had the idea of treating myself to a movie after all the exams I've been taking lately. I'm an avid horror fan and knew that Terrifier 2 was in theaters, so of course I wanted to see it immediately. One of my friends told me they found it funny and really enjoyed it, which was more than enough reason to go see it. Side note, it was good and hilarious, but if gore is not your thing, I do not recommend it. I was looking at tickets the day before yesterday and trying to decide which time slot I wanted to see the movie in. Looking back now, something in my gut told me to choose the earlier time. I wish I had listened. Another detail I want to add is that there are two bus sizes, a large one and a small one. The bus I rode during the incident was the smaller one. The stop where I got on the bus is the beginning of the route. Unlike every other stop, the driver usually parks the bus here for five minutes and gets off to use the restroom or have a quick break before continuing with the rest of the route. Upon entering the bus, I noticed only two other passengers, another girl about my age and an older man. The girl was in the front of the bus on the right side, and the man was in the second row on the left side. I sat on the right side several rows back. I usually read something on my phone or listen to music on the bus, so I immediately got on my phone when I sat down. Everything was okay for a little bit until I looked up and noticed the man repeatedly staring at me and looking away before staring at me again. I was immediately apprehensive, but just brushed it off. He started speaking aloud out of nowhere, saying things like, Beautiful baby, and so damn fine. While staring at me, I was frozen out of fear and could only keep looking at my phone and trying to ignore it. This continued until I worked up the courage to say, Sir, would you please stop staring at me? To which he claimed he was not staring and told me I was just extremely beautiful. Unsure of what to say, I just stupidly thanked him and went back to my phone. He had his body slightly turned, but when I confronted him, he faced fully forward. The driver got back on and we started moving again, so everything was calm for a bit, though I was admittedly still shaken up. This calm did not last long. Obviously, this creep couldn't contain himself and just had to voice his opinions about me out loud. He started saying similar things again, but also added some new phrases such as, gonna make you my wife, and by far the worst one, 
I'm gonna get you pregnant. I was shaking at this point and was unsure of what to do. I desperately wanted to sit next to the other girl, but did not want to pass by him to sit by her. We made it to two other stops before the girl got off and said sorry before leaving. My heart dropped to my stomach. The last thing I wanted was to be alone with this guy. Luckily, more people got on at this stop. A middle-aged couple and a guy about my age. In a panicked voice, I sort of shouted and asked the guy my age if he would sit with me. He was a bit confused but came to sit by me and I immediately felt relief. The stress of the situation got to me and I broke down crying. I guess the creep took this as an indication to leave because he swiftly made his exit after that. The kind younger guy who sat next to me and began to comfort me. I am so grateful he chose to ride the bus that day. The bus driver noticed the commotion and called me to the front to get information in order to make a report. He told me he couldn't hear anything but that buses had video and would hopefully pick up what the creep was saying. He told me that that same man had recently been kicked off for a similar incident and that he would be reporting this immediately. For the rest of the ride, the younger guy and I talked about things like majors and other school-related stuff. I want to go into marine biology, and he is a graduate student in mechanical engineering. I made it to the movies. It was awesome, by the way. And back home safely. But I definitely learned a lesson. My boyfriend is going to help me look into some self-defense items and he taught me a few fighting tactics. I am still sitting here shaking just writing this. I'm actually really afraid to leave my room now. Sometimes, it's easy to forget that creepy encounters with weirdos can happen at any time. They aren't just stories on the internet. In May 2009, I had just broken up with my girlfriend of almost three years. We had moved from Calgary to Toronto and were still stuck living together after the breakup as we didn't know many people in the city yet. Needless to say, the situation was pretty stressful and upsetting. So when a buddy I was going to school with at the time suggested a weekend camping and fishing trip, I jumped at the chance. He grew up in an area about an hour outside of Toronto called Flamborough. It's really beautiful. Loads of lush forest, farmers fields, and small rivers and creeks. We decided to camp and fish along a creek called Grindstone Creek. It's close to some wetlands and the fishing is supposed to be great. We ended up setting up our camp in what was probably a farmer's field. I'm guessing it was trespassing on our part. Bordered by a gorgeous forest. We spent the evening fishing, shooting the shit and drinking some quality craft beers. As it got darker, we made a little fire and roasted potatoes and hot dogs. All in all, it was a really good night. We turned in just after midnight. We shared a tent. My buddy fell asleep before me, and I stayed up playing on my phone until probably about 1.30. I must have drifted off because the next thing I remember was being woken up by a high-pitched, yipping-type noise. I was kind of groggy, and it took me a moment to fully wake up. The yipping was incessant, and it sounded like a weird coyote. I laid there for a moment, listening, and then started playing on my phone again. The noise was annoying as hell. I tried ignoring it, but it sounded like it was getting closer. Finally, it sounded like it had to be no more than 10 feet from our tent. At this point, 
I was getting a little unsettled. I had seen coyotes in Calgary before, and I thought of them as pretty harmless. They never looked much bigger than a smallish dog. But what if this one was rabbit or something? What if it could smell our food? I have a pretty bad anxiety disorder, so I'm prone to worrying about these types of things. I nudged my buddy to see if he was awake, and he was. The noise woke him up, too. We discussed what to do about the coyote, as we hadn't brought anything to scare off critters. Not a BB gun, nothing. Finally, he decided he would shine the flashlight on it and holler at it, hopefully scaring him off. He unzipped the tent, and I watched him pointing the flashlight out into the darkness. I'll never forget what happened next. His legs suddenly went all wobbly, and he sort of stumbled backwards into the tent. He had a really dumbfounded look on his face when he looked at me and babbled. <laughs> it's not a coyote. It's a dude. It's some weird dude. Normally, I would have thought he was messing with me. I'm a huge wimp and scare easily. I won't even watch horror movies. But I've never seen someone look that scared. And I never want to see that expression on someone's face ever again. So I knew he wasn't pulling my leg. The weird yipping and howling type noises were still going on. And in retrospect, it really didn't sound like a coyote. But I guess in our groggy states, it was a way for our brains to make sense of it. Anyways, he kept telling me just to look out the tent flap to make sure he's not crazy. At this point, I was having a full-blown anxiety attack. My heart was racing. I felt like shit, but I had to look. So I slowly peeked out the flap and waited for my eyes to adjust. And that's when I saw him. He was standing only a few arms length away from the tent. He was swaying a little and wearing a baseball cap. What made it awful though, what was really creepy was that he was wearing women's lingerie. That's when I knew there was most likely something very wrong with this guy if the making high-pitched noises at a stranger's tent in the middle of the night didn't give it away. After I pulled my head back inside the tent, my buddy and I discussed what to do. Finally, we decided to yell at the guy to F off. My buddy starts yelling, Excuse me, can you F off? We're trying to sleep in here. The noise stopped. It was dead silent and that's when we heard footsteps running towards our tent. They stopped right outside the tent, but we didn't waste any time. We started yelling again. Seriously, F off. We have cell phones in here. If you don't F off, we're going to call the cops. With that, we heard him walk by the tent and head off. Sounded like he was moving towards the road. Needless to say, we laid awake, petrified until the first sign of sunlight. Then, we hightailed it the hell out of there. We discussed our experience on the way home, and we were both pretty embarrassed about how scared we got. It definitely was not manly on either of our parts. I think because we were both ashamed of how we let some weirdo freak us out so much. We really haven't ever talked about it since that day. So, there you go. There's my weird story. I'll always wonder what the hell that guy was doing out there or what was wrong with him. Sometimes, I wonder if things would have turned out differently if we were a couple of girls. I'm not saying he was some sort of serial killer, but he seemed like he was testing who was in the tent. I guess I'll never know, and for that, I'm kind of glad.
This happened to my roommate and I two years ago when we drove into the National Forest just outside of the town we live in. We go to a small college in New England, about three hours away from any major city. For context, this forest has quite a few urban legends surrounding it and the local community, although they do not go there often, have a lot of superstitions about how to be safe while there. I had just broken up with my partner and my roommate could sense I was feeling down. Finals were just around the corner, so she decided to help me get my mind off things and suggested we go to a nice spot she had found last week and just chill and de-stress. We took a couple of beers with us and drove to this secluded spot in the forest. From the moment we left the main asphalt road into the forest, I saw a couple of things that unsettled me. You could see abandoned houses of a ghost town from the higher ground the road was on, and we saw this old doll hanging from a rope on a tree. Creepy shit, but we really didn't give it a second thought and kept driving. We got to a clearing and parked our car behind some trees, popped open the back of our SUV and started just talking and playing music. About 10 minutes into this, two cars appeared from the road and parked in the clearing. My friend didn't pay them attention. Instead, she kept talking. But as I was facing them from where I sat, I couldn't stop seeing what they did. A guy popped out of each car, talked for a few minutes, and then I saw them take out a long object covered in a dark plastic bag from the back of one of the cars. This is when I noticed these guys had guns, and not like shotguns, which I see often in this town, but handguns. Then they started lighting the bag on fire. I told my friend to get down, and she turned around and saw them for the first time. Black smoke was rising from the bag, and between trying to keep my head down and still glances at them, I saw them take out a second object then heard them shoot at it right before they set it on fire. I don't know how long my friend and I were lying there in silence, but it was definitely enough to let the terror sink in and whisper to each other how much we loved each other in case this was what we thought it was. At some point, I looked up and saw that they were pointing at our car and saw them walking into the woods maybe trying to follow our tracks or trying to look for us. All I know is that right then, I told my friend to jump into the driver's seat and make a run for it. I shut the back door, and between that and the car starting up, the guys heard it and started running towards us, then ran towards one of their cars and hopped in. We went over a hill and driving way above what was safe for dirt roads on a hillside, We lost them. We drove to a neighboring town and roamed around for a while, just to make sure no one was following us, before we went back to our dorm. That day, we tried to make fun of the whole situation and got really drunk before finally breaking down and crying from knowing we had seen something we were not supposed to. We were at first terrified of telling anyone, but eventually did tell officers on campus who contacted the police, but they never did find anything. To the two creepy guys in the forest, I hope we never see you again. Edit this part of the audio by itself. Almost a year ago, I was an opener at a resort, clocking in before 5 a.m. each day. The resort is located inside of an affluent neighborhood in a very wealthy town and suburb. Employees had to park in one of two parking lots at either ends of the property, and the lot I chose was adjacent to a long, and windy road 
outside the resort, which led to the rest of the neighborhood. The road and resort were separated by a short range of brush and trees that no one ever walked through. I'd arrived one morning per usual and put the car into park with my headlights still on. The lights in the lot weren't ever on in the morning since no one else really showed up before 6 a.m. when the sun was out, so it was usually always dark at the start of my walk. Say for security, I was one of the first employees to arrive on the property each morning and was usually completely alone in this particular parking lot at this time. This morning didn't seem any different. I had my hand literally at my keys, my brain in the process to turn off my car, when I noticed a young girl, maybe like 14 or 15 years old, came scampering. Her body language was the exact definition, run with quick light steps, especially through fear or excitement. Through the span of trees that separates the resort from the outside road, She was directly in front of my car, and my headlights illuminated a clear view of her in the pitch black. She looked like she was in high school, had long blonde hair, and was wearing a jacket with pajamas maybe, like she just walked out of a house. One thing about her that bothered me was that she wouldn't stop laughing and smiling. I couldn't hear her laughing from outside the car, but she was visually giggling at something I wasn't aware of or could see, and it was so unnatural. She occasionally glanced behind her as if someone else was there waiting away from the headlights. She then waved at me like it were a normal gesture at this time, and then immediately ran to my passenger side door. This all happened in a matter of seconds, and I wasn't really sure what was even happening, besides my anxiety spiking. I know I simultaneously yanked the aux from my phone to shut whatever song had been playing off while grabbing for the lock button. I remember feeling panic for never remembering if it's up or down to lock when the girl began pulling violently and incessantly on the door handle on the passenger side. I realized because I didn't turn my car off, it stayed locked. She began pounding on the window, and I was screaming at the top of my lungs for her to leave before pressing on my horn. I could see her laughing outside like this were some type of game, as if I were a silly friend not letting her in as a joke. After a few seconds, she stopped the pounding and tried to open my car door. Her face fell flat like I disappointed her, and she started to walk away from my car, back the way she came. She waved at me again before squeezing through the trees, out of the view of my headlights. This whole encounter confused me almost as much as it scared me. Most people I told the story to just chalked it up to her being on drugs. But that narrative hasn't felt right to me despite her behavior. Maybe she was just being an extremely out of touch teenager whose parents needed a firmer grip on her. My first thought was possibly human trafficking but I'm not sure if that would fit this scenario, as I'm not the most well-versed with the subject. I told someone when I made it to LP, and they didn't seem to care much. I didn't call the police, and now I regret that. I'll never get out of my brain, though, how freaking off the feeling was watching a stranger, seemingly alone, pop out from the trees in the darkness laughing, and then try to violently enter your car in an empty lot. I do think the possibility of someone else being present the whole time is a lot more scary, and I wonder who else was there and where exactly. 
I'm just glad it all ended. To the scary girl and possible other person, I hope we never meet again. I am now a 40-year-old female, but I'd went to the university at Buffalo Fresh out of high school in the early 2000s. At that time, the online world was a bit like the Wild West, which included having to do quite a bit more digging to find specific information than today's split-second Google search. As such, it was a much easier time for colleges and universities to hide or spin campus crime statistics to make themselves look better for prospective wallets. I mean, students. Case in point, I was at orientation a month or two before my freshman year, and one of the mass presentations I had to attend was about campus safety. Bright-faced, upperclassmen orientation aides enthusiastically verbally filleted the school, boasting about how North Campus was in, at the time, the safest town in the country, Amherst, New York, and that the only murder in recent history has occurred nine years ago, to an unfortunate student named Linda Yalem, who was murdered on the campus's bike path during a lone early morning run. It was a fate that, we were assured, could be avoided by simply not hitting the bike path alone. What they conveniently didn't reveal was that A, the killer hadn't been caught, and B, Galen wasn't his only victim. He was a serial sexual assaultist and eventual serial killer who had already been active in the area for at least 25 years in downtown Buffalo and on the secluded bike path of the Buffalo suburbs. In retrospect, had this information been as readily accessible as it is now, it probably would have kept me from the most bone-chilling encounter of my life. Fast forward three years... I was a very depressed 20-year-old who was struggling with her sexual identity and her parents' reaction to it in a much less accepting time than now. I'd left school and, to avoid being home, shacked up with a woman who'd promised me the world but then rejected me in favor of her ex-girlfriend on the night I moved in and eventually turned out to be a felon who drained vulnerable would-be love interests' bank accounts. Though that's a very convoluted story for another time. So, clearly, I was an unhappy young adult, desperate for love and a sense of belonging, sometimes to my own detriment. Despite my roommate's many unkind and hurtful gestures, I stuck with it in the naive hope that she would eventually come around and fulfill her pie-in-the-sky promises to me. On a particular July night, that hope just fell flat. I was at Roxy's Green Room, a now-defunct lesbian bar and club that many wayward Buffalo lesbians, myself included, flocked to at night to fill a much-needed sense of community and to hopefully land a special someone. Since the latter just wasn't happening for me, and since I didn't yet know what kind of person she really was, I was still stuck on my roommate. She liked to dangle emotional carrots overhead out of some sick joy that she got from making me hurt, but also hang on to hope. And after a promise to hit Roxy's alone with me and talk about us, she showed up with her ex turned current and shut me out. I was wounded and upset enough to leave around 1 a.m. Well, before the 4 a.m. last call, that I was still young and spry enough to stomach, and without a ride home, like my usually wiser self would have secured. While my apartment on Delaware was walking distance from Roxy's, 
it was a good half hour walk. Being as emotionally changed as I was though, I angrily hoofed it down the main street sidewalk, still managing to follow the pedestrian rule of walking against traffic despite stupidly ignoring a rule I knew well from years of watching forensic shows. If you're a woman, never leave a bar at night alone, especially if you're walking. I got exactly halfway home when a dark green sedan started driving toward me. I thought nothing of it until the car slowed down near me as I walked. A lone middle-aged man was in the car with a skin tone that I originally associated with the guy being Italian, but in retrospect, he could have easily been Puerto Rican. He had dark hair and, most importantly, almost impossibly dark eyes that seemed to hold no light of good intentions. Now, I was used to guys being pigs, I've been catcalled by downtown construction workers when an ex-girlfriend and I shared a kiss and I had endured all matter of wholly unwanted, graphic and ham-fisted advances from dudes at school. And although I'd never take the stance that I was asking for it, I was young and thin so I was dressed in a tight red crop top with flare-legged black spandex pants. The get-up was meant to turn women's heads, so I wasn't exactly surprised that I caught the attention of the wrong sex. I paid it little never mind past mild irritation that a guy old enough to be my dad would look at me like that as the guy drove off and turned at the next intersection behind me. My walk resumed, I put the guy out of my mind and I continued my trek, but the peace didn't last. About two or three minutes later, I see a familiar green car coming up on me again. This time, the guy's window was down a bit and he shouted, Hey! In a beckoning manner and gestured in a way that made me wonder if he thought I was a Lady of the Night. Now, that incensed me. Despite my recent struggles with my identity and the resulting entropy in my life, I was always a good kid. I flashed him a quick, annoyed look to inform him that, despite the mildly revealing clothing, he was barking up the wrong tree for several reasons, and then I ignored him, focusing forward. He sped off again and turned again. At that point, it was clear that the dude was casing me like a cat burglar cases a house. It was before the time of Uber or even widespread use of cell phones, and with no cabs passing by, I had little hope of getting one. Public transit existed, but it was both sparse and not running nearby. The stretches of Maine between intersections were long, and I'd probably be spotted on them anyway, since the guy was circling. Being 15 minutes away from both Roxy's and my home, there was also no way I could get anywhere near either place before the green car came back around again. I quickly thumbed through my mental Rolodex of true crime-inspired safety tips, that should have kept me out of this situation in the first place. Tip number one, get to an open business, inform the clerk, have him or her call the police and stay put. Then the guy would either give up or get caught. I was coming up on the convenience store on the opposite side of the street where I'd bought a pack of cigarettes earlier in the night. But as I got closer, The desolate blackness through the windows told me that it was closed. I looked around for something else. Another bar, a gas station, anything. But the street was flanked by shuttered brick buildings and a lock-up church. Then came the headlights in green again. Again, 
the guy slowed down as he approached me, but his demeanor had shifted again. He put his palm out impatiently, as if he couldn't understand my lack of complicity. Come on, the guy yelled through his now open window, his face an equal picture of aggression, intimidation, and frustration. I kept out of arm's reach on the sidewalk and once again ignored him, but this time, I was properly shaken. He angrily punched the gas and was off on his familiar circuit back around to me. Now, I knew I was in trouble. The guy's behavior was escalating and I was genuinely scared that his next move would be to grab me off the sidewalk and pull me into his car. From there, God only knew what sort of depravity I was in for. I scrambled through my memory for another safety tip, and I remembered that making myself both impossible to ignore and obviously in distress could get me some much-needed attention from an outside party. I ran into the middle of Main Street and started frantically waving my hands and shouting at every car that was coming my way. The first car drove by. The second car drove by. The terror in me was palpable. I knew the stories of city dwellers like Kitty Genovese, who were left to their horrible fate at the hands of monsters, by jaded throngs of people who heard the attacks, perpetrated on them, and their cries for help, but did nothing out of both an assumption that someone else would step up and a reluctance to get involved. Would I be the next victim of the bystander effect, snatched away to an early end because of big city indifference? As I was beginning to lose hope, but still determined to keep trying while thinking of my next bold move, a van pulled over that had four black guys in it. As a white woman, I was relieved. I knew that Statistically, male predators overwhelmingly tend to prey on women of their same race. In a game of numbers, this van full of guys was exponentially safer than that single stalker in the green car. I opted to take the gamble. I frantically told them about the man in the green car who kept circling around the block and following me and begged for a ride. The driver asked if I had any money in exchange for the favor. I didn't. Then he asked if I had any cigarettes. I may be one of the only people you'll ever meet who actually had her life saved by cigarettes. Though I had never been a smoker before, I briefly picked up the filthy habit because New York State bars still allowed smoking and it was a weird part of Buffalo lesbian bar culture that I emulated to fit in. Yet another way that I was, as are many, kind of an idiot in my late 20s. Yes, I answered urgently. I I just bought a pack and you can have the whole thing if you get me home. Admittedly, I was initially a little miffed that the driver wanted something from me in exchange for not letting me get abducted off the street as well as the implication that he may not have helped me if I had nothing. Still, I had the Marlboros. He had a vehicle, and the stars had, hopefully, aligned. Regardless of how it went down, I had help if he let me in, and the details didn't matter. After a second or two of thought, which seemed like an eternity to me, the driver agreed and one of the two dudes in the back opened the side door for me and got out so I could slide into the seat behind the driver. As the door to my safe carriage full of impromptu nights shut and I got buckled in, I looked out my window just in time to see the green car creeping past the van and proving to my saviors that I was telling a very disturbing true story. Until my dying day, I will never forget that man's eyes. Feeling safe, surrounded by a closed band full of young, tough-looking rescuers. 
I looked that bastard dead in his eyes. Part of me was rightfully terrified, but another part of me wanted to look right at him defiantly and tell him with my eyes, I got away from you. I win. I was repaid with the most evil, hateful look that I've ever had directed at me, let alone seen. His eyes were black. Black like a cat's eyes get when it sees a bug in the house, and its hunting instincts cause its pupils to blow to allow more light in. But at least there's usually a hint of playful mischief in a hunting cat's eyes. The eyes I was seeing were those of pure, unadulterated predator, and the vitriol that practically oozed from them as he glared at me, let me know exactly how he felt about his prey, having the audacity to elude him. He drove off into the night, and so did we, in a bit less direct route to make sure that we lost him. After a blessedly quick jaunt with frequent looks behind my shoulder, I was delivered home, one pack of cigarettes short but alive and in one piece. The first thing that I did when I got in the door was to check the locks on absolutely everything. After that, the adrenaline started to wear off and the pure fear set in. I was so terrified that the man in the green sedan was searching the area when I got dropped off that I grabbed the cordless phone, then lay completely flat on the living room floor for hours to keep totally out of sight from any of my apartment windows. As I laid there, I called the Buffalo police and relayed my terrifying tale in as much detail as I could give them. Being painfully aware of the prevalence of hate crimes against the LGBT community at the time, I told the cops that it was possible that the man was cruising near Roxy's to prey on vulnerable queer women who were out and about. In hindsight, I think the guy just saw who he thought was an easy mark out by herself and availed himself of the opportunity to strike. Fast forward another four years and I'd moved out to Chicago to live with my then girlfriend. For about half of my four years there, I was pretty homesick. I'd never lived anywhere except my home state of New York and I went there knowing no one except my ex, who wasn't exactly an empathetic soul, adding to my feelings of isolation. I coped by keeping up on upstate New York news so I'd feel a little less far away. On a chilly mid-January morning in 2007, I was at our computer looking up headlines for my home state when one from WBFO popped up that immediately snared my attention. Bike path sexual assaultist is arrested. By then, I knew the moniker well. The internet had since aged into a beautifully organized respiratory of, sometimes, knowledge and, despite the lack of transparency from my alma mater, I became familiar with the Buffalo area mystery man and his active status throughout my time in Buffalo. Now, I had a name for the specter responsible for that bit of eeriness that was always in the back of my mind when I was a student. The bike path sexual assaultist was revealed as Altimo Sanchez, a middle-aged native of Puerto Rico who coached his son's sports team and was affectionately referred to as Uncle Al in his neighborhood. As with many other killers, his disguises were his community involvement and just being ordinary. The man was estimated to have been responsible for 9 to 15 sexual assaults around the Buffalo area since 1975 and had confessed to three murders the Yalman murder in 1991, a second in 1992, and a third watch had occurred only three and a half months prior to his capture. I don't know if you've 
ever felt your heart somehow get wedged up into your voice box and get dropped into the depths of your stomach simultaneously, but believe me when I say that, it is possible, given the right catalyst. For me, that catalyst was the printed proof that the man was active while I lived in Buffalo and frequented Roxy's. More so, I knew that serial killers rarely take breaks as lengthy as the one between his 1992 and 2006 killings. He had to have at least been attempting to sate his evil impulses for those 14 years. That realization gave me a very, very bad feeling that I'd crossed paths with someone much more dangerous than I had realized. The news article had no picture of Sanchez, but the sickening feeling in me prodded me to find one. It was almost as if I knew what I would see before I even looked at him. I Yahoo searched his name, because that was still a respectful means of finding things on the internet in 2007. And I was horrified, though not surprised, to see those same black, soulless, predatory eyes that I looked into four times on that summer night in Buffalo in 2003. The timeline fit. My profile as a victim fit, if he did, in fact, mistake me for a downtown prostitute and bearing all else. I knew those eyes. I had a potentially deadly close encounter with Altimio Sanchez, the bike path sexual assaultist, a.k.a. the bike path killer. My lack of sense put me in his orbit and a band of angels pulled me out of it. I know who I saw, and as God is my witness, I will never be convinced otherwise. Though many of the sexual assaults fell victims to statutes of limitation, Altimio Sanchez pled guilty to the three murders and was sentenced to 75 years to life in prison. In essence, the guy won't be exposed to the outside again unless he's in a body bag. So, bike path sexual assaultist, even if you're worm food and being wheeled out in a bag on a prison gurney, I hope we never meet again. And that, dear listeners, is the end of these true Let's Not Meet stories. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you kindly. If you are awake and listening, I hope you have enjoyed this collection. Until next time, I'll read to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night.